There we go. Good morning, everyone. Time to go ahead and get started by singing number 417. We'll sing all three verses, and then we'll have a Bible reading and prayer. 417. Walking in sunlight, all of my... Bible reading this morning is from Psalm 91, the 16 verses of Psalm 91. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Version this morning. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, he, and under his wings you shall make refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and bulwark. You will not be afraid of the terror by night, or of the arrow that flies by day, of the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, or of the destruction that lays waste at noon. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. You will only look on with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. For you have made the Lord my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil will befall you, nor will any plague come near your tent. For he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will bear you up in their hands, that you do not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread upon the lion and cobra, the young lion and the serpent you will trample down. Because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high because he has known my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. 
with a long life, I will satisfy him and let him see my salvation. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we are certainly thankful for your protection, thankful for your refuge. We're thankful for the security that we have in Christ. We're thankful for uh, every spiritual blessing that's, that's given from above, and we are, are certainly thankful this morning for the, the opportunity to gather and to assemble uh, as your children, uh, to pay honor to your son, to remember him, um, to sing praises to his name, and to study your word. Father, we're thankful for this congregation that meets here at Dayton. We, we ask that you continue to bless us with uh, uh, the blessings that have preceded us over these years. And we thank you for um, every leader and every member here. Father, we pray for those that are not well enough to be out this morning. We're thankful for those that have made it back, and we pray that you would continue to bless us with a measure of help that's within your will. Thankful for a beautiful day and the rain that we've had. As we go forward this morning in our Bible study and throughout our worship, we pray that you would um, look down upon us, protect us with your, um, your hand of, of truth, and protect us with uh, everything that you see fit. We, we pray that all the teachers this morning will recall their study, and the, the students will be good listeners, and that we'll apply the word of God to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We'll go to our classes now. Teachers can go first. We have the nursery, this is zero to two year olds, three to five year olds. The first grade through the fifth grade, middle school and high school. The young adult class. Then we have the ladies class that meets in the fellowship room. We have the adult class here in the auditorium. Morning, Francis. I'm doing really good. How are you doing? I like that sweater. Is that new? No. First Corinthians one will be our chapter this morning. If, if you're uh, using your foundation study book, it's um, lesson two. Page 13. One of the first, um, I guess, go-to chapters for a young preaching student is typically 1 Corinthians 1. Um, it's one of my favorite individual chapters in Scripture simply because it defeats it defeats the idea of denominationalism in in one chapter uh, and it's an encouragement to congregations of course Paul was writing this letter to encourage um, 
the congregation at Corinth based on some feedback, I guess you'd say, that he'd been getting. Um, and he handles it quite well. And it, it's a reminder to uh, members of congregations how important and how critical the congregational um, heartbeat and the congregational, um, the essence of the life of a congregation is. Um, Churches of Christ, as we know, or you may know, are autonomous, which means that each and every congregation is in and of itself self-governing and and self-responsible for what is taught, uh, for what is, uh, as far as the works that go on, the, the approval of, of speakers, the approval of uh, distribution of funds, and it's more complicated than you may think to manage uh, every aspect of that, of that endeavor. Um, the idea of division that is going to come forth from this passage and the, and the absolute disgust that Paul had for it, and God has for it, by the way, um, if you can conquer that idea of, of um, division being not acceptable, it really is a stumbling block for those who would say, um, you go your way and I'll go my way or um, however that argument comes to be. So with that being said, as an as a introduction, I guess, to this uh, passage in 1 Corinthians 1, uh, we're going to read the text and then um, go back and look at some aspects of the text itself. <clears throat> in the book... On page 13, the, the uh, passage picks up at verse 4. I'm going to start in verse 1. Uh, there are some aspects of the introduction that Paul gives that I, I want to point out. 1 through 3, Paul, called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified. In Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with all who in every place call on the name of the Lord, call in the name of the Lord, of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, this first three verses is a general introduction and, and... dictates the audience, the author, and so forth and so on. Uh, it would seem that Sosthenes is a scribe that would help Paul to pen to paper. Yes? Yes. Yes, ruler of the synagogue. And the, the idea of grace and peace... Two of the most fantastic words in Scripture um, that really are the, found, are, are the foundation of the coming of Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, and his imminent uh, return. Um, only, only, gra- only Christ gives grace, and only peace is found in that grace. And he, he starts off by reminding them, it's not only introduction, of his authority, but it's reminding them of the gift that they have received. And I think it's very strategically written as a setup um, for, for what he is going to say uh, when he says that they're saints, he says that, um, that they call on, on Jesus' name, they've been sanctified, they have grace, they have peace. It's a reminder, you know, when, when I was in retail, if you had to uh, objectively be critical of someone, the most effective way to do that was uh, a, 
a compliment sandwich is what I called it. You know, a compliment sandwich. I'd say, you know, Jim, we appreciate you being on time like you are every day. You're real good at that. Now, your department needs to be cleaned up a little bit, need to work on that. But all your coworkers are liking you. You see what I did there? I put, I put a critique in the middle of two compliments and made a compliment sandwich. And I think Paul is setting the top layer of bread here because he's fixing to nail them on some things. And um, he reminds them of who they are, why they are who they are, and the fact that uh, they have a gift that is beyond comprehension and that they need to recall that. Okay, so moving into the passage that the book covers, verse 4. I thank God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him, in all utterances and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into his fellowship, into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you speak, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it's been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this that each of you says, now I say this that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptize any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of wisdom, lest the cross of Christ should be made no effect. Okay. I have a note in my Bible here, and I want to get to that so I don't forget to say it. Contention in this passage in verse uh, 11 is the Greek word eris, E-R-I-S. And I think we all can um, probably guess or have enough knowledge walking around since to understand what contentions mean. But in a word study, which are very, very effective if you ever have an opportunity to do word studies, there. at first I was you know, skeptical of word studies and just figured it's just busy work for the students, but it, it helps you understand the intensity of that word is very violent. Um, the intensity there in eris and the tense that it is, is, is more than just uh, we'll agree to disagree. This was, this was a very, uh, it created a lot of strife in Ephesus. I'm sorry, in, probably in Ephesus too, but in, in Corinth. Enough to where a whole letter is um, uh, generated uh, by this uh, feedback that Paul got. God does not like it when his brethren are being contentious, heiress, to the point, well, they don't like any of it, but to the point of this level of strife needed to be addressed. It needed to be shut down. And it was not, um, we see from the scripture, it was not a, a small portion of the congregation. It says, each of you. Each of you say. That leaves no one out. Each of you say, they had, they had sub, sublet themselves out to a man uh, whom they followed. And uh, that's very dangerous. And uh, I'm not going to get into how often that happens 
and examples of where it's happened and, and how it might, but it certainly was an issue and um, the word heiress there is, is there's an intensity there that, that needs, needs to be considered insomuch that he was pleading with them. Um, now, <clears throat> maybe you have a thought on, on that or a, or a comment. Okay. The, uh, the idea of um, the gift that they had, what gift is he speaking of? Verse 7 says, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation. The, the, the Lord had um, given, we see in other, other passages, some are prophets, some are evangelists, some are this, some are that. The Lord had dispersed spiritual gifts in this age, correct? Um, and the church at Corinth was absent of no, of no gift. They, um, so that you come short, that, that embraces the entire congregation at Corinth, come short of no gift. They had every um, opportunity, every, every gift available. Now, one person didn't have all of them, did they? Um, some may have different, but every gift was covered in their congregation. And it was, it was verified in, in the resurrection of Christ and through their, through their salvation. So, and, and he does that to build up that, look, God has spared you no gift. God has spared you nothing. You have all knowledge. You have the complete gift of grace and not only that, he has spared you no spiritual gift. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It would seem that he was explaining that God had spared them nothing. Uh, they were they were not shorthanded in those that could prophesy and those that could. Uh, uh, do the things spiritually speaking that were necessary for a congregation to function fully and correctly. Uh, so it took away the, well, we didn't have this gift. We, how would we know? Not, you know, it, they had the opportunity through the gifts that God gave them. He had spared them no gift. Now, there is a sense of a gift that's given in salvation. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, the, the saved by grace chapter, uh, and the saved by grace passage um, explains to us that the grace of God is a gift of God. Um, it is not something that you earn. It is something that was given in Christ Jesus. If any time, and I've said this um, many times, and probably will say it more, any time you see the word grace in Scripture, it's a five-letter word. Grace, G-R-A-C-E, equals Christ, C-H-R-I-S-T. Christ and grace are equivalent. When you see the gift of grace, you can insert the word Christ. The gift of Christ. All spiritual blessings are found in Christ Jesus. The spiritual blessing of grace and forgiveness is only found in him. So when we see that someone received grace, they received Christ. And later we'll see, by command, example, necessary inference, is their decision to obey the gospel. Um, the confirmation that, that he speaks of is the second coming of Christ. When he takes us to be with him in heaven, that will be confirmed. And it will be confirmed in them. <clears throat> um, it, it also would seem that we would eagerly await that. We, I think we may have discussed this um, last week. I'm not, I'm not sure if that was the, the conversation I was having, but 
You know, oftentimes we eagerly await Christ, but, you know, Lord, come quickly, but, you know, maybe make it the late bus, if you know what I mean. <laughs> not, not today or maybe tomorrow. Um, it's, it's, have you ever found yourself having difficulty praying, Lord, come quickly? Um, maybe these were, and maybe he was explaining that they should eagerly await his return and demonstrates the faithfulness of God in verse 6. And he gets to verse, or verse 9 rather, and he gets to verse 10, which is a memory verse for every preaching student in the history of the world, and is a passage or a verse that, that uh, it should be and probably is very familiar to any member of the church that's been a member of the church for more than a, uh, an amount of time where they've heard sermons. Preachers should preach on... Um, the dangers of division. Uh, oftentimes, uh, it, it, let's just say it's 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 a complicated task to get that sermon correct, and and do it with love, and to ensure that your listener understands uh, the love of it. Uh, you just can't say, "Hey, don't be divided." It, it needs to be a little bit more than that, I think. But he says in verse ten that he pleads with them. So he's thanked them, verse 4, which is, you know, the title of the lesson is thanking and pleading. He thanks them, in, or thanks God, rather, in verse 4, um, that he gave them the grace, that he gave them Christ. He enriched them in everything. They have every gift. They've come short of no gift. It will be confirmed in them. God is faithful they were called in his fellowship unto the Lord. So one through nine is a friendly reminder, that top layer of bread in that sandwich that tells them who they are, where they've come from, what they are now, and that the blessings of God have been showered upon them fully and no gift has been held back. Now, I need to tell you, I beg you, I plead you, there's an idea of pro pronation in this where he drops down, and that's my thought, and, and prays and begs and pleads as in pleading for your life. Don't be divided. Why would you be divided? Why would you be uh, positioning yourself behind some man when that man did not die for you? That man did not forgive your sins. That man did not put you in grace. That man did not put you in a spiritual... What has caused that? What has caused this? Human nature has caused it? What else? I'm thinking the D word, anybody? No, that's a P word. Pride. Pride. The devil. How do you how do, how is the best way to conquer any any um, entity? Divide it. Divide it. The best way to conquer an entity is to cut it to pieces and divide it because they're stronger as a whole. So my thought on that, and we can talk about it another time or in private, is that the devil is hard at work in dividing congregations. And he sometimes does that um, through men. Now, was Apollos and Cephas, were they nestling over in corners saying, hey, be on my side? I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't suspect that, that that was so, but there, was, there was, seems to be a certain pride in, the, in the, whom baptized them. So, yes. Okay, divisions weaken. Divisions weaken. If, if everyone spoke the same thing, how strong would the church be? John, do you have a question?
Yes. Because they were all one language. But what happened? They were divided up, right? And the purpose behind that was to what? Right, to, to, to weaken them. And so, he pleads with them, verse 10, calling them brethren again, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, there's the authority by which he pleads to them, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together. Koinonia is the word. Koinonia is the idea of knit, knitting. When you knit something, when you weave something together and it's tight and that bond cannot be broken, that's koinonia. When you see the word fellowship in your passages and, and, uh, and it's used here too, it's koinonia, that bond that cannot be broken. You see these commercials, this guy puts a boat together with glue and it can go or whatever. I forget his name. Billy Mays here. Uh, with the glue that will not break. I always think of koinonia, and that's kind of the weird things I think about. But the koinonia that he speaks of, perfectly joined together, in the same mind, the same judgment. How hard is that? And what do you think, I'm going to leave this open, what do you think specifically he may be speaking of? you Lord doctrine what was going on at Corinth um, well look at verse or chapter 14 you can see some things that were going on they weren't being orderly right they they were uh, having worship issues they were having communion issues, right? What other issues were in Corinth? That's an easy one. False teachers. Um, if there are false teachers in a congregation, do sometimes people rally behind them and have a have a sect in the in the church? And who, who is ultimately uh, responsible for that type of thing? Elders. Well, for, responsible for its, for, its, for its happening, but responsible to guard lies on eldership. Absolutely. Well, and that that could be the case. I, I um, first of all, if I did know, I wouldn't, from a public uh, aspect, address any kind of thing like that before addressing the elders, talking to the elders about it. But if there were, if there were these types of contentions uh, that were outwardly being expressed. It would be something that the elders would need to address. Amen? If it were something that, um, and believe me, I've been around a little bit, congregation-wise, okay? And congregations have a heartbeat. This congregation, to Summer and I, there's a reason we sold out everything we had and placed ourselves back over here. All right, we could have went anywhere in the world, and we decided we decided to move our our whole kit and caboodle back to Dayton based on this congregation. All right, that's and I know people who have sent their kids to college based on the congregation that's nearby. No, can't go there. There's no faithful congregation. Whatever. The heartbeat of a congregation is very important. We're blessed here at Dayton. Now, do some of you in this assembly or some of us in this congregation um, have different aspects or are at different, as my brother 
Jesse Nelson would say, are we at different places in our spiritual walk? Absolutely. Uh, and I'm not convinced that that uh, other than myself and my wife, I, you know, how do I know your heart? How do I know your spirit? Only a man knows what, what's within. You may have a different aspect of, of Scripture uh, that's not in line with Scripture. But if it's being outwardly promoted and if it's being uh, cultivated as it seems to have been in Corinth, it was something that needed to be addressed it was something that needed to be rectified. It was something that needed to be squashed. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Amen. To stop division, the truth is the is the uh, the remedy for all things. Yeah. This this doesn't seem to be whether or not baptism for remission of sins is necessary for salvation. This doesn't seem to be uh, th that particular thing because it seems that the major aspect of the division they were encountering was if, if, if Jim baptized me, I am of Jim. If Charlie baptized me, well, he made me a Christian, I am of Charlie. And that's just not the case. He, the, and <clears throat> in, the, in, in their defense, you know, they didn't have the completed word. They didn't have the, the longevity of study that we have. And he was just correcting some things. Things sometimes need to be corrected in congregations. They had women that were uh, uh, out shouting the men, chapter 14, in, in uh, worship. Women were to remain silent as far as their authority over a man in doctrine. That was an issue. Um, I'm sure there were, there were influential women. We know that. Um, even with re regard to the house of Chloe. And, and the, the, uh, uh, the different women in, in scripture. They were not partaking of the communion in a manner that was reverent. Uh, they, were, they were a long laundry list. They were suing each other over uh, civil aspects of life. Um, and there was a lot of contentious things going on. This wasn't whether or not you had to be baptized to be saved. I don't think. They, were, they all were placed in Christ by that. Um, quickly, he, he, in 14 through 17, he sets the idea of who baptizes you over here. And says, that really doesn't matter who baptized you. I... I didn't go around baptizing, he says, because I didn't want people to say, oh, the great Paul baptized me, you know? Um, uh, I don't know if that was a conscious uh, thing at the time, but it, it goes to the irrelevance of the baptizer and the more relevant idea of the baptizee, okay? And what the grace, the, the knowledge, the peace, the gift the list of things in 1 through 6 or 7 that he says they received in that. But we're going to go back to the questions quickly. Because anytime I have a questions page, I want to try to get to those. I, I feel them out. I know y'all like to sit down and feel them out. And I just don't feel like the class is complete. We don't at least touch on some of them. What, uh, page 20. What was Paul thinking? What was Paul thankful the Corinthians had been given? Anything else? 
it, gray, I have grace, enrichment, which was the gifts, and all knowledge. Now, is that a supernatural knowledge of all things like God or Christ? But no, all knowledge pertaining to life and godliness, First Peter, right? Um, number two, what did Paul say was confirmed to the Corinthians? In them was confirmed the testimony of Christ. What, what, what is the testimony of Christ? His resurrection. The, confir- the confirmation of Christ Jesus is that he rose from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. The confirmation and testimony that Christ is the, the Son of God and that he is it's where, found, where salvation is found, grace, peace, all those things, that is confirmed that he rose from the dead. All right? And they did the same thing, right? When they were baptized for the remission of their sins, their sins were washed away, and, he, and they rose to walk in newness of life, as he would go on to say. That was the confirmation that they received. Number three, how did Paul describe God? Faithful. Or we do serve a faithful God. What did Paul plead with the Corinthians to do? Speak the same thing. Be united. Um, no divisions. Um, does that mean I can't... Look, some of you people in here are Bama fans, and that just I just don't get it. Maybe not in this room, but they're here. I know y'all are out there. And... Uh, you live in Tennessee. I don't know if you was born here, but you know that people in general are Tennessee fans. So, you know, you're just doing that because, you know, it's divisive. Is that what, you know, now should I go up and prod you? I didn't prod Michigan here when they, when they won the championship. He's not here to defend himself, but Michigan, I mean, he... He deserves that championship. I feel great for him. You know, South Carolina beat my Lady Vols in a... That was just heartbreaking. But you know what? That's not what we're... That's not division, okay? That's nonsense when it comes to biblical things. He's talking about, I need to have the same uh, doctrinal convictions as you. And if there is a difference in doctrinal conviction, which there are, trust me, I've had to clean up some awful messes where we've been. Seriously, serious messes where people were not grounded. And, you know, new emerging church. You ever heard of that? The emerging church? I tell you, I've seen, not, not seen it all, but I've seen big mud puddles that you had to wade through to help people out to get right. And it's there. Count your blessings as a congregation. How did Paul know about the problem? Now, was that the right thing to do? If we had a problem here, would we write a letter to, you know, Saudi and say, hey, look. Well, it's a different era and it's a different time. Paul had started that congregation and they knew that he could address uh, the issues at hand. If you look at Acts 15 we see that a, that a council of leaders addresses an issue at that time and made judgments on it in Acts 15. But I, I commend the house of Chloe for asking questions that need to be justified, justifiably answered. Who were the Corinthians attempt? Attempting to follow. I have Paul, Cephas, and Apollos. Anybody else? Well, yeah. They, they, Christ is there too. I'm of Christ. I'm of Paul. I'm of Cephas. <laughs> Lastly, what did, what did Jesus send Paul to do? He preached the gospel. And um, he again tells Timothy in 1 Timothy you know, preach the word. Preach the word. What? Well, 
Okay, well, I, I think a, that's a great, uh, that's a great uh, thought. Um, and in, in, and if, if, if I were approached with that, my first thought would be to say, hey, look, let's read that and make sure, you know, what that really means. And, and wrap that around the context that, that's involved. And context, and the context there is the, 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 the segregation of people that are, that are following the people that baptized them, not the idea of the necessity of baptism. And that's a... Yes. That's okay. In in conclusion, the truth 